Hello, welcome to AC System. I'm Craig and we're going to talk about HVAC. So heating, ventilation, air conditioning system. And as I, as you can tell, kind of frigid. But we're going to talk more about, more than just AC system, we're going to talk also about the controls and the um, components along that system. So before we go any further, let's uh, kind of get a quick overview of the refrigeration cycle because that's important to understand how air conditioning works. Um, I'm not going to go too much right now, but basically you have a, a compressor of some sort. It's going to move refrigerant into this high pressure side through a component called a condenser. It's going to condense. That comes over here through expansion device. And then that goes to this low pressure side that kind of divides the compressor and expansion device, uh, divides the high and the low side to the evaporator and then back to the compressor. So this whole cycle and these components is the refrigeration cycle, but it's here to basically absorb heat and move heat. Okay, and what I mean by that is when you're talking about making something cold, are you making it cold or, or are you removing heat? And, and I know that sounds like minutia nomenclature, but that's essentially what we're doing. We're not really cooling something, we're just removing the heat. The absence of heat is cold. So heat is attracted to cold. If we can remove that heat, we can attract more, more heat to it and get dumped that. So the refrigeration cycle is going to transfer the heat from the passionate compartment into the atmosphere. That's the premise of how this works. Uh, what, where does that heat come from? Well, outside radiation, solar load, heat from outside air, and of course, passengers as they breathe and uh, create heat inside that cabin. The more people, of course, it gets stuffy and warm. So we need to remove this heat to make it comfortable for us in this car, or, or more comfortable. That's the point of AC, right? It doesn't matter if it's in a car, your refrigeration in your refrigerator, the uh, your, your central cooling system in your house, air conditioning, uh, making something cold by removing heat, it, the whole process of that is dependent on the refrigeration cycle. And that refrigeration cycle is kind of dependent on a couple things called latent heat of vaporization and latent heat of condensation. Basically what that means in a nutshell is if you think about when you're out in the summer and you're hot and you start to do what? Sweat, right? Ooh, it sounds gross. Okay, but when you sweat, why does your body sweat? So if it puts liquid on the skin and then that skin evaporates because it's hot out, what happens to that liquid, right? It evaporates, turns into a gas. As it's turning into a gas, it's going from a liquid to a vapor. That absorbs heat. So when it evaporates off your skin and, it, and you get that cooling sensation because it's pulling heat out of your body. That's why sweat makes you cool. Then when it condenses in the atmosphere, it's going to reject that heat that it absorbed from your body when it turns back into a liquid into the atmosphere. So that's what it's doing. That, that water cycle is basically absorbing heat and rejecting heat. It's just transferring heat. It's not creating heat. It's not creating cold. We're just transferring it. So that's how the refrigeration cycle works in a car. And again, in the back to our basic circuit, we have a compressor and an expansion device that kind of divides the high and the low side. And the way this works is the compressor um, is basically a pump for refrigerant. Um, and that pump is going to move the refrigerant through this, this, these components and this AC system to absorb heat in the passenger compartment and reject it into the atmosphere. So we'll start off with the compressor because it's right, it's kind of the heart of it. As it compresses a gas, not as in gasoline, but a gas as in not liquid, this gas refrigerant, it's going to be a high pressure, high temperature gas that comes over to the condenser. When it gets to, con to the condenser, it has atmospheric air and fan blowing on it. It's going to, by name, condense into a liquid. When it does that, it rejects the heat in the refrigerant. Remember, this is a high pressure, high temperature gas. It turns into a high pressure, high temperature kind of liquid over here, uh, mostly liquid. And as it comes out of this liquid state over here, it goes to an expansion device and then divides again to the low side. So as it goes through this fixed orifice or thermal expansion valve, it's going to divide to the low side where it becomes, it's still a liquid, but it's going to be low pressure, kind of warm liquid, not so much hot. As it comes down through here to the evaporator, it's going to boil in this evaporator. When it turns into a, a, a kind of a gas out here, it's going to absorb that heat. Now your fan, Inside your passenger compartment, the blower motor is blowing passenger air across this evaporator, and then it absorbs all that heat goes into that refrigerant as it as it evaporated, um, just like as you sweat, and then that carries the heat over to the compressor. This right here is all gas, and then it goes because it has to be gas to go to the compressor, otherwise it'll blow up the compressor because um, fluid can't compress. So then we compress this gas, and now you understand why we started off with high pressure, high temperature, because that came from the compression and from the heat from the passenger compartment. All of that heat goes through the condenser. As the refrigerant condenses, 
back into a liquid, it rejects the heat into the atmosphere through the fins by the radiator and then uh, and the fan motor, and then the whole process keeps cycling over and over again. And that's how you get the inside of your passion compartment warm or cold. Sorry, <laughs> just moving on. All right. So refrigerant circuit, there's two different styles we use in cars. We use a, a fixed orifice tube and a TXV or thermal expansion valve. And again, I know this is going to be super fast, ton of info, but you'll get more of this in the engine's AC class later on in the program. So back to our circuit, remember the pump was right here. The pump came out, went to the condenser by the radiator, goes through these tubes, a bunch of fins to increase the surface area. As that refrigerant goes, goes through here, it's turning to a liquid at the bottom right here. As it condenses, it's going to reject heat. Remember the, that, that process, the refrigerant cycle, um, or uh, latent heat and condensation. So as this turns into liquid, it rejects heat. These fans blow across these fins and that dumps the heat in the atmosphere. So this refrigerant then comes over here. Here's a little inline filter. There's our expansion device on this system known as an orifice tube. It's fixed. It's just what it says. It's an orifice tube. That divides the high and the low side. It comes through this side over here as a low pressure, uh, warm um, liquid. It's kind of actually not, it's not a liquid. It's kind of a drop leaf form of, uh, I forgot the exact name of it, but it's not a pure liquid, not a gas. It's kind of a droplets in here. So this comes through this evaporator core where it's going to continue boiling and evaporate into a gas. As it does that, it's going to absorb heat from the passion compartment because you have a fan blowing on this evaporator. And so all that heat gets absorbed in the refrigerant, which is cruising through here. And it goes to this AC accumulator, which is only used on the fixed orifice tube system because the purpose of this accumulator, uh, the internal design of this is that when this comes through here, any liquid, it dumps at the bottom as a tube that goes down right here. And then the tube that goes to the compressor is up high. The inlet to this tube is up here. So they're not connected together. It comes in here so that only gas can go to the compressor. This prevents any extra liquid that didn't boil in the evaporator from getting to the compressor. Because if liquid got to the compressor, liquid can't compress. It's called hydrolocking and pow, you blow up the compressor. Now the other style system is what's called a thermal expansion valve. So it works very similar, but if you notice, there's no accumulator over here. Instead, on the, we have a receiver on the high side. So here's what we changed, the expansion valve. Instead of that, that fixed orifice tube, we have a valve that can vary. It's a variable orifice tube. So the orifice can be big or small, depending on the temperature coming out of the evaporator. So this little heat sensing tube, it's monitoring temperature. And then a little capillary tube over here will change the size of this orifice based on temperature coming out. And you're thinking, why do I care about temperature coming out of the evaporator? Because temperature and pressures are direct indicator whether or not this is a gas or a liquid. And we want it to be just on the verge of liquid, but we want it to be a gas coming out of that evaporator. So they're all calibrated so that it only lets enough refrigerant through this valve that is needed to turn all of this into a gas. So there's no liquid coming out on the back side of this evaporator. That's the idea anyway. But because remember in the fixed orifice, we had to have an accumulator catch over here that kept the liquid from getting to the compressor. So on this system, we don't because this is the auto regulating adjusting system. But what it does need is it needs pure liquid to get to the expansion valve for this to work. And to do that, we have a receiver dryer right here, which removes moisture, but also, um, again, moisture is like water. Okay. So the system shouldn't have any water in it. It has liquid, but not moisture. If that makes sense. It's a refrigerant, not a water. So what this little device here does is as the refrigerant comes out of the condenser in, in a liquid form, mostly liquid, like I mentioned earlier, it drops to the bottom of this right here. These little desiccant bags remove the water, but then this tube right here only allows liquid to carry on to the expansion valve. So the opposite of an accumulator because it lets only liquid through instead of only gas. So to recap, this compressor makes pressure, right? And there's different ways it does it. We'll talk about later. It pumps refrigerant through, and then it goes to the condenser as gas, where it condenses to a liquid, so it rejects the heat here, comes through here, dumps to the bottom of this, only liquid goes up, goes to the expansion valve, and this orifice changes size based on this heat sensing tube's temperature to make sure that all of the refrigerant that goes through the evaporator boils and becomes a gas. And as it comes through here, it's pure gas, no liquid, to the compressor with all this heat from the passenger compartment, and then heat from the compression of this compressor and it goes back through dumps in the condenser Ooh, crazy but pretty cool how this works right so let's talk a little bit about more of these components and we'll come back to that
in a little bit. So right here you have some cutaways. Here's your familiar receiver dryer that we talked about earlier. As it comes in, only liquid goes through. Here's the inside of a compressor. Um, here you have a condenser right here as it passes through. Here's an evaporator. That's what's inside the cabin. And then here's your fixed orifice tube, that variable, uh, fixed, sorry, uh, thermal expansion valve. This is what that variable orifice that changes um, the size of this opening right here. What's cool about this one is it's self-contained. It doesn't have a, that capillary tube and the sensing bulb far, far away. It's got it built in right here. So it's kind of neat little system. So compressors basically compress based on a couple different designs. You have a swash plate compressor. I'm not going to go into these. This is for AC class. This is pretty complicated, simple, but complicated. Um, you have a piston type compressor. You have a vein compressor. So it works much like a pump. And you have a scroll compressor. And then you have the most popular is a clutch to, uh, to control that. So most uh, AC systems is going to have some type of a clutch to operate all of those compressors. Um, some don't. Some are electronic. So, But this is the most popular way. And, and the way this system works is you have a stator coil, which is a wire, a bunch of wires in this section here, that when you run current through, it builds a magnetic field. That magnetic field is going to attract the clutch plate to close in on this pulley right here. And you can't see the clutch plate yet, but it's going to close in on this pulley, which is moving. This pulley moves with the engine, but it's not going to um, move the arbor of the um, AC compressor until the coils turned on, the magnetic field, and it basically, everything gets connected electromagnetically, and it turns the compressor that way. Here's a cutaway. So right here, you have the pulley, which is right here. See a serpentine pulley right here? This section spins free on a bearing until you, until you apply a, a current to the coil. That magnetic field links this clutch right here, this front area. It'll link this with the pulley right here. So it links it as one unit. So the, the belt turning the pulley will turn this clutch. The clutch is splined to the shaft of the compressor. So that's the way it turns that. It'll totally, totally make sense when you get to engines and AC. Um, as far as the condenser goes, now you look at a condenser, it looks like a radiator. It's got these tubes and fins on it, but these tubes are hollow and they come through here and they're really, really, really tiny because the more surface area you have, the more efficient this is. And then you put these fins rotating around through here because that's going to, again, cre increase the um, surface area, which allows you to reject more heat, which is what the condenser does. And you have fins on the evaporator because it absorbs heat. So the more surface area, the more efficient. Here's that receiver dryer. We talked about that earlier. Some of them had sight glasses to tell if there's bubbles going out or not. Not that common anymore. It just became a leak point. And then here's your cutaway of expansion valve, which we kind of talked about how this one works. So there's that valve that opens up and closes based on the temperature of the outlet of the evaporator. Here's what a fixed orifice tube looks like. The small orifice is right here and they're color coordinated. The color of this tube tells you the size of the orifice. So if you were to pull out, say a green one, you want to put in a green one. It's kind of the gist of that. Here's your color choices. Different size shapes and orifices is what those colors indicate. If you ever pull one of these out of a system, of course, obviously the system has to be depressurized using an appropriate legal machine. And there is actually a lot of regulation on a technician that can handle refrigerant. You have to get what's called an MVAC through a company like MACS <laughs> to get 609 compliant so that you can be a, a AC technician because it is a complex system and it is uh, not good for the environment. So we want to make sure that people are educated on how to control that refrigerant. Here's your evaporator. A lot of fins on that for surface area. That's what's inside the cabin to absorb that heat. Um, and then some different systems with refrigerant have different seals. I'm not going to get into that too much, but they have different disconnects, couples all these things with steel lines. Um, etc. So <clears throat> basically that's going to be video one. Stay tuned for video two.